10. We're going to finish chapter 10 this morning. We're going to look at verse, uh, verses 32 through 39. The title of the message this morning is, The Just Shall Live by Faith. And this is what the writer of Hebrews is wanting his readers. His readers are Jews who have received Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And he's wanting them to come to grips with this in their life. The just shall live by faith. This is what he's trying to convey. This is what he's trying to communicate. This is what he's trying to impress upon their hearts. When one is born again, the whole standard of meeting God's standard of righteousness changes. It is no longer rules and regulations and rituals of the law. But as Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. And I can't think of anything that would probably be more disheartening or the pressure that comes upon people is that, well, I'm more righteous than you. I'm more spiritual than you. Look at what I've done. Look at all that I've done. And and these are my works. And, you know, it's by grace that we have been saved through faith. Now, the writer of Hebrews is going to illustrate this further in the next chapters. We have chapter 11 is um, called the Hall of Faith. And he's going to really relate uh, the men and women uh, of God that, uh, that have walked by faith. And so he's going to illustrate that more fully in the next chapter. But for now, he's reminding them of how that step of faith has and will personally affect them. Because the pressures are now coming from without. They're also coming from non-Jewish uh, believers in the community to actually challenge them and intimidate them to compromise their simple walk of faith back to a works-oriented relationship with God and it's beginning to seriously affect their walk. Now when you look at this letter and when you look at this phrase that is really a revelation, the just shall live by faith. As we listen to this proclamation, this is so important to us even today. Whenever one takes the step of faith to walk with God, there will be opposition to that step in your life. Because it is a life-changing decision. Especially in light of what Jesus said. Why would he say even believers are in the world, but they're not of the world? He's telling us the believers are going to stand out. We are going to stand out because he said, now you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And so there's going to be, there's something different about the believer. When we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. And the believer is not simply going to go along according to the course of this world, as Paul writes also in Ephesians. Not going to go along just the way general society would have us go. And Satan does not like anyone defecting from his team, so to speak. As a believer, you can expect unsaved family, friends, neighbors, classmates, co-workers, even other Christians to take a little different look at you because a radical change has taken place in your life. A change in the way that you view and live your life now. I know when I accepted Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, things were opened up to me that I never saw before. And I know the same thing is true for you. Things opened up in your life. You saw things that were just, I never saw that before. Because God has shed different light now upon these things because our heart has been changed. There's a change in the way that you interact with others with your neighbors, with your uh, family members, with the people that you work with, with the people that you go to school with. To come to Christ, I want you to understand, is not just becoming religious. It's not just becoming religious. It's not just changing religious beliefs like trying a brand new product on the supermarket shelf. It's not upgrading to a newer model. It is passing from death unto life. As far as the Bible is concerned and what it teaches is there's Christianity 
and then there's everything else. There's Jesus Christ, and then there's every other religious and philosophical belief. But at the heart of Christianity is Christ. He is the object of our faith. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man will come to the Father but through me. And then there's everyone else and everything else. Every other religion, every other religious philosophy and philosophical belief. The point I'm trying to make is that becoming a Christian is different than being anything else or becoming anything else. And it's obvious and interesting because of the persecution. Jesus warned over and over again, in this life you'll have tribulation, you'll have trials, you're going to have persecution, you're going to go through it. Because we stand out. We're different. We're not just going along with the flow. We're not politically correct, so to speak. Okay? There's a difference in our life. Jesus also said, He who is not with me is against me. So we stand apart in the world. He who does not gather with me scatters. So Jesus drew a distinct line. He drew a distinct line of separation with that statement. He who is not with me is against me. Is not for me. He who does not gather with me scatters. And so the focus here is that these are now being intimidated. These people that this letter is being written to are being intimidated and pressured to go back to the old way. Come on back to the way things used to be. Go on back and compromise your walk of faith. And in some respects, for them, as well as it is for us, we're reminded here, get used to it. Get used to it because it's gonna, there's going to be some kind of persecution in your life. There's going to be some kind of opposition to your life as a believer. Some pressure, some intimidation to compromise. We can call it spiritual warfare if we want, but whatever it is, it goes with the turf. Because whenever one makes a decision to follow Christ, remember you are in the world, but you are not of the world. And everything that's a part of the world and a part of the world system and philosophy that opposes Jesus Christ is going to come against you. Circumstances and people will challenge you to compromise a simple walk of faith. The movies that you see, the books that we read, the magazines that we flip through, the relationships that we develop and the people that we hang out with, but the just shall walk by faith. Not sight, not feelings, not emotions, not the pressures and intimidations, but the just shall walk by faith. So look at verse 32, chapter 10 of Hebrews. But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me and my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods knowing that you have a better and enduring possession for yourselves in heaven." Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. And this is the word of God for us this morning. Father, please, we ask, pour your spirit out upon us. Father, if there's any distractions that have been going on in our life this past week, we pray, Lord, that we'd be able to set those aside. We pray, Lord, that we would have focus, Lord, upon you and upon your word today. And God, that we would just be able to receive and to hear what the spirit would say. Lord, you've prepared a table for us today. And we want to partake, Lord. And we want to be fed. We want to be nourished. And even as Scott prayed earlier, we want to be challenged if we need to be challenged. We want to walk, Lord, that walk of faith. We want to stand tall. We want to let others know that we are yours and you are ours. And we want to honor you and exalt you. We want to praise you and bless you with our life and with our lifestyle. And so, God, today we pray you pour your spirit out upon us. 
encourage us and teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. The just shall walk by faith. And so he's calling to remembrance. He says, remember the former days in which after you were illuminated, after the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ was shined in your heart. Remember, after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. So this isn't anything new, he's saying. Things that you're going through right now, things that you're experiencing, why those things are happening right now isn't anything new. The battles that the believer encounters in everyday life, the challenges that we face as Christians to compromise a walk of faith, let me tell you, it can be unrelenting. Just when you think that you have gotten over something, oh, the victory. Mm, something else just comes along. Something blindsides us. Something just comes from out of nowhere. We don't even know where it is half the time or where it's come from. Yeah, we do, don't we? Something to trip us up. Something to, you know, a decision. We have to make decisions every day in our life. And sometimes these decisions are going to cause us to say, now, what would Jesus do? And we have to answer the questions when we make those decisions. What would Jesus do? What decision would Jesus make? How would, it, how would he answer the question? The just shall live by faith. I want to tell you, sometimes the inner fight, the inner struggle that goes on to make a stand to follow Jesus can be harder from that fight that's coming from without. I'm reminded of the story that Jesus tells, uh, that John tells after Jesus had given his discourse on the bread of life. And the scripture tells us in John chapter 6 that many were offended. You see, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the, the elite of the day, accused Jesus of teaching cannibalism because he's talking about his body being the bread of life and he's talking about his blood and eating and drinking of his body. And they who were spiritual men but were walking on an earthly plane never realized or got the spiritual significance of what Jesus was talking about. And the scripture tells us that many of his disciples, many of those who were following him went back and walked with him no more. And then it's interesting, in John chapter 6, it's interesting that verse, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more, is John chapter 6, verse 66. How fleshly can that be? But in verse 67, Jesus says, to his, the ones that remain. Do you also want to go away? When pressured, when intimidated, do you also want to go away? That's a question that we have to ask in our own hearts, in our own lives today when we make decisions. When the intimidations to compromise, when the pressures to compromise come our way, do you also want to go away? And I love what Peter said. Peter answered him and said, Lord, where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. And also we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter was exercising his faith. He wasn't going with the flow. He wasn't going with the popular majority or the majority that seemed to be so popular at the time and, and had left. He, this, this was not a politically correct statement that he was making at this time. But he was making a stand. He was making a stand for his faith in Christ. You remember Jesus said, straight is the gate that leads unto life. Narrow is the way that leads unto destruction. You know, there's going to be a lot more there's not going to be a lot more people walking down Broadway than are going through that straight gate. I've walked on Broadway in New York City, and it's interesting. I mean, there can be just crowds of people. And you know, it seems like the flow is just going one way. And I've walked against that flow, and it kind of, it kind of comes to light, you know, just what he's talking about here. Because there's many that are going to be going in on the Broadway, down Broadway. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads unto life, because broad is the way, and wide is the gate that leads unto destruction. And it's the easy way. It's not easy to, to go against the current. Have you ever seen the salmon swimming upstream? 
I mean, I've, I've seen them, and I've seen them, you know, try to get on that waterfall to get back up to the top where, they'd, where, they'd, where they were coming back from. It's an awesome thing to see them as they're going against the current to go and, and to, to try to get back upstream. But it was hard and difficult. But sometime, in some way, in our everyday life, there's going to be times when our faith is put to the test and the just will walk by faith. Our faith will be put on trial. Notice he says here, verse 33, partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. The word gazing stock is a word that we get our word theater from. It's the word theater. And it means to be put on public display. And I'll tell you what, these first century Christians were many times made a public spectacle, spectacle even to the martyring of their life, their faith. I mean, for being martyred for their faith. Now, you might feel that way today sometimes. You might feel that, 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 that as you're put on a public display, you know, you're just being a martyr. How many times have, 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 have you been ridiculed, those of you who are going to school? How many times have you been ridiculed and embarrassed in the classroom because you don't toe the line, the public line of some, um, uh, you know, popular teaching or a certain curriculum? How many times has the professor or the teacher, you know, called you out? made a public spectacle of you in class when you have made a stand for Jesus Christ. At work, you might feel the pressure to go along with the, with the water cooler banter. You know, the dirty jokes and the, and the off-color jokes that are happening, and people want to draw you into those things. You know, maybe even sometimes it's like, you know, how about just flirting a little bit? The temptation to just flirt, to feel accepted. You know, ah, oh, you know, I'm just one of the guys, you know, or I'm one of the guys. Challenges to compromise. When you draw the line, you're a marked man and woman. Maybe ostracized for making a stand for your faith and the basic principles of Christ that you've chosen to live your life by. Many times your life may be put on display. I've told you about my experience when I accepted Christ as my personal Lord and Savior and how I was brought into the record company uh, president's office and I was challenged, you're not going to give me any of that Jesus music, are you? Right after I accepted Christ, I'm making a record, you know. You're not going to give me any of that Jesus music. Word got out fast that Richie had become a Christian. And I'll tell you, back in 1974, 75, 76, when that record was made, it wasn't popular. It wasn't shortly thereafter that it became kind of like a covered over thing and it was, it was really popular. But it wasn't popular when I made that decision. Let me tell you something about my life. When that phrase came to me, you're not going to give me any of that Jesus music, are you? Music was my life. I didn't have a degree. It was the only way that I knew of making a living in my life to provide for my family. That was all I knew. I had dropped out of college. I didn't have any degree to fall back on. There was no other directions to be led in my life. But it was hand to the plow and don't look back. That's what it amounted to. Hand to the plow and don't look back. And it was a decision that I made right away. And I'm thankful that I made that decision. Because looking back now, I know it was God's grace in causing me to make that decision because he knew very well the temptations and the pressures and the intimidations that would lie in wait to draw me back to the glamour of your lights, of your, of your name being up on lights at Carnegie Hall, or your name being up in lights at Madison Square Garden. He knew the temptations of falling back into that trap. Has it been hard today to reconcile in my heart the decision I made 30 years ago? Seeing almost that every one, that every person that I have been closely associated with have gone on to realizing really a pretty significant success in the music business, in the recording business. 
something that I set my sights on when I was a teenager. And they had gone on to, to, to attain a certain amount of success. Hey, I'll tell you the truth. I would lie to you right now if I told you that such thoughts never crossed my mind or that the temptations haven't come. Because Satan is relentless. Satan is relentless. But it doesn't take long to put everything into perspective. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 26... Jesus said, For what profit is it to man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What is a profit if you have all that all that the world has to offer and you lose your own soul? Let me tell you something. That puts it all in perspective real fast. Puts it all in perspective. But there's still persecution. There's still temptation. There's still intimidation. He says here it even comes from hanging out with those that believe. You know, maybe you felt that way, you know, as you're kind of entertaining and kind of just, you know, you're, you're kind of getting introduced to, to Christianity and, and you have someone share, they, you had someone sharing uh, their faith with you and trying to lead you into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, you know, you're hanging out with Christians and all of a sudden, you know, you, become, you get put on public display. You get put on public display because now you're no longer hanging out with the old crowd. You're not, all, you're not all going to the same places, doing the same thing. But it's different now. Going to church? With who? What? Huh? Been there. Done that. <laughs> Just hanging out can label you. Hanging out with believers. Felt the change from old friends? I did. I have. People that I thought I could count on in a moment. Gone. Gone. Just don't even, you know. (laughs) Some have even experienced resentment in their own homes. When a son or a daughter, or a mom or a dad, a husband or a wife accepts Christ and begins to walk with Christ, taking up their cross and following Him, and they're ostracized in their own home. They're made a public spectacle, go in their own home. For these believers, for many of us, it's been hard. He goes on to remind them even of more things that have happened in their life and and the consequences also of their compassion for him. Look at verse 34. You had compassion of me and my bonds and took took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. What does that say? Knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and enduring substance. You see, there's the thing again. She said, you know, what is the profit of man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? You had compassion of me and my bonds. So not only were they passionate for Jesus Christ, and he had, the writer had seen the passion that these had for Christ, but also he saw the heart. He saw the compassion that they had for him, he says, while I was even in bonds. Now, I want, I want to point out here, many uh, take this verse to believe that the writer of Hebrews is the Apostle Paul. And I, you know, I mean, it's a pretty significant verse. And there's a verse in chapter 13, uh, also, verses 23 through, and 24. And what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, that make one leave, you know, can cause you to believe that Paul was the writer of Hebrews, yet there is nothing really significant to tell us that he is the writer. It's not introduced as many of Paul's letters are. He begins most of his letters by Paul, a servant, or bond slave, or whatever, Jesus Christ. And there's nothing here. So, so we, we really don't know that. But whoever the writer was, he says that these people that he's writing to, not only did they have a passion for Christ, but they had compassion for him. While he was in jail, oh boy, I don't want to talk to them. You know, I don't even know what their walk is like if they're in jail. I mean, you know, they had to do something to be in jail, you know. And Jesus said, man, if you come and visit me while I'm in jail, you came and visited me, you gave me a drink of water, you reached out to me. Tell you what, we had a great opportunity 
not long ago, just to go visit a, a, a person in, in, who's in jail here. And, you know, this person was bitter. You could tell that they were angry. You could tell that they were just really uptight. And I got a call from a brother back in uh, California. He said, will you, go, will you go visit my relative? And he said, sure. And so we went. And now that person is hungering and thirsting for Christ. That person is reaching out. We've given them new believers Bible studies to do. And they're doing the studies and they're doing them faithfully. And they're, that, that walk with the Lord, they accepted Christ. They prayed with us right there while we were in, in, uh, you know, talking with them. I have another friend that's back in Ohio. I, I'm telling you, my heart has touched this, this, this guy. He, things went south in his life for a while. But I tell you what, he says now the best thing that ever happened to me in my life was that I've spent the last I know, 18, 18 months in jail. And I'm telling you, this guy, when I get letters from him, I'm saying, my goodness, God has touched this guy's heart. Because I had conversations with him. They were kind of like the super, fit. yeah, I'm a believer. But, I, but now, there's no doubt in my life, this guy is on fire for the Lord. He has a ministry. He has a ministry right there. You know, people who visit. He says, these people here had compassion for me. You write letters to people that are, you know, maybe struggling a little bit difficult, more, have more difficult times than we are. Do you take the time? He said, this guy was in jail. You know, I'm sure he was in jail for his faith because that's what this whole thing is about. The just shall walk by faith. And so to associate with him, that means it put them on the spot. Even, he says, you took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. It seems like they had possessions taken from them. What if just associating with a Christian or being, or, or being known as a Christian, you lose your job? Because you can't go along with the flow of this world and the things that, you're, that your job may be, may be requiring of you. Make a stand. Do you too want to turn back? Or do you make a stand? Do you make a stand? Early on I was reminded to keep a light touch on this world. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is. Don't lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Have a light touch on this world. You see, in some respects, these must have had a light touch on this world. Because they said they took joyfully the spoiling of their goods. You know, if things mean so much to us that if we lose them then they've become idols to us. They're simply idols. Have a light touch on this world. The decisions that we make as we take a stand for Christ, we've got to count the cost. Count the cost. Because you know, bottom line, it's not what man thinks. It's what God thinks. It's what God thinks. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. James writes. So in choosing to take up one's cross and follow Jesus, let the decision be easy. It's his way, period. It's his way, period. We sing, Lord, I want to live my life to please you. I bring my life before you to remold. Make of me a vessel fit for honor that I might shine for you as sparkling gold. Oh, now what we want our life to do to just shine forth a sparkling gold for God. I want to live my life to please you. And then he says, I, I mean the song says, I bring my life before you to remold. He's the potter. We're the clay. Sometimes we get on that potter's wheel and he's making a beautiful vessel. You know, we've seen Mike and Pam here, and we've seen Mike as he makes the vessels, you know, the clay, pot, the, the, the clay uh, pots and all. And, and you know, we watch how he mm, moves things around, how he mm, puts his hand down in there while it's going around on the potter's wheel. And then when it's done, it's like, whoa, look at this. I had no out of this 
funky piece of clay, something so beautiful could be made. And we squirm around a lot, don't we? When we get on the potter's wheel, we squirm around. Lord, I want to live my life to please you. I want to live my life by faith. I bring my life before you to remold. God, mold me. Break me. Lord, whatever it's going to take, you are a servant. Make me one too. See, that's what it's all about. It's about becoming a servant. And so with confidence, hand to the plow, press on towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Verse 35, cast not away, therefore, your confidence. Don't look back. Do not cast away your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. Hold on with reassuring faith. You know, Pastor Chuck Smith, I've heard him say it, it's not scripture, but he says constantly and reminds people, don't doubt in the dark what you've already seen in the light. And when the light of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ has been revealed to us in our hearts, hand to the plow, don't look back. Press on towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Walk in the light and you'll not fulfill the lust of the darkness. Hold on with reassuring faith, faith, the writer is telling these believers. And he says, remember what I wrote to you just a little bit earlier. I really believe this goes back to chapter 6, verse 10, where he says, God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. So he's reminding them, hold on with confidence. For you and me today, hold on. And then let us take it upon ourselves to help others. Maybe a brother or a sister who's having a struggle in their walk right now, come alongside to remind them to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Remembering that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. He says, we need, verse 36, to have patience that after we have done the will of God, we might receive the promise. Patience. Are you being tested this morning? Is there something going on in your life today, this past week? Maybe something that's been lingering where your faith is being tested. Maybe to the point of of, of intimidation, compromise, whatever. I don't know, but maybe there's something going on in your life. Do you know the hope? You do, don't you? As believers, we know the hope that we have in Christ. The promise that we have in Him. He is coming again. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 He's coming again. He's right now waiting for the signal. You, for you have need of patience. Hold on. No matter what comes our way, hold on. For after you have done the will of God, that you might receive the promise. God is faithful. This exhortation here is don't look back. Don't look back. Don't give up. Remain steadfast in the things that you know to be true. You know, our faith isn't blind faith. Blind faith would be stupid. It would be dumb. Well, just go walk off that cliff, you know. There's... Oh, you're not, not going to hurt yourself. It's only 350 feet down. Duh. Duh. Our faith is not blind faith. We are following him who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And today he says, I am seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you, to encourage you, to strengthen you, to reassure you of your hope to give you confidence that while you are being tested, while you are being tried, while there are those saying, oh, look, man, how many times have you prayed for that situation and no answer has come? Well, I'm here to tell you an answer has come. Wait, maybe, huh? (laughs) There's yes, there's no, and there's wait. But I know that the Scripture says, and I don't doubt in the dark what I've already seen in the light of God's Word, when He says that He will answer our prayers, and He does answer our prayers. Well, not fast enough for me. Then he's talking about patience. He's talking about patience. I I see we have a little bit of time. I was kind of flying. Turn to uh, 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. 
Peter was writing to some people that were really having their, te- their faith tested. Their faith was being tested. They were being put on trial. As I said earlier, sometimes the first, these first century uh, Christians, I mean, it was to the point of death. It was to the point of death. First Peter chapter 1. In verse 7, Peter is really thanking God for the promises. And Peter said, you know, in his second epistle, I'm going to remind you of these things, the hope that we have. He's talking about, in verse 7, the genuineness of your faith being, verse 7, much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire may be found a praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The hope of the believer. Though we haven't seen the way that we see each other here today, our eyes of faith have been opened. Our spiritual eyes have been opened and we see the Lord. We see the Lord high and lifted up, as Isaiah says. Look, turn over to Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 1. And at the end of that chapter, I guess it's the middle end of that chapter, Peter says, we didn't follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And they saw, in his first coming, they saw the power and the glory of the Lord. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. They heard, they saw. They saw Jesus. And you know what? Peter was confident enough in his faith and in his walk. When he saw his Lord crucified, when he saw his Lord crucified, he was still confident enough in his Lord to allow his life, well, to become a martyr. He knew the hope of his calling. Not in this life. Not in this life alone. But also in the life to come. He obeyed the will of God for his life. To let his light so shine before men that they may see his good works and glorify his Father which is in heaven. That's what God asks us to do too. Just let our light shine before men. To be a testimony and a witness of God's grace, his love, his mercy. Because he's long-suffering for us, let us be patient with him. (laughs) As he's working his, his glory. The will of God for his life was, the will of God for Peter's life was to literally lay his life down. And do you remember we read from history that Peter was crucified upside down saying, I'm not worthy to be crucified as my Lord was crucified. Turn that cross upside down. Crucify me upside down. I'm not worthy to die the same death. You know, for you and me today, it might not be physical death that we experience as a martyr for Christ. It might be. It might be for some. But nevertheless, it is to lay our life down. And it is to walk in faith. It is to walk in faith as we patiently wait for His appearing. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. I want my life to be a testimony of your grace as I wait and I hope in your promises. Verse 37, For yet a little while and he that shall come will come. That's a promise. That's a promise that we can count on. For yet a little while and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, 
My soul shall have no pleasure in him. Jesus said, anyone having put his hand to the plow and looking back isn't fit for the kingdom of God. So we just keep going. We just keep pressing on. We just keep going that way as God molds us and shapes us. We just keep going on about our business, letting our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. And I pray that God would give us the strength to persevere even through those difficult times in our life, times that even cause us to doubt and wonder. Times when we're afraid, maybe sometimes. You know, and you might fall. You might give in. The Proverbs 24, 16 reminds us that though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up. See, that's the thing. David fell over and over and over again, yet he was known as a man after God's own heart. Because when he was convicted in his heart, he repented. And that's what it calls for basically for us. Though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up, Lord. Forgive me. And I hate what I just did. And I don't ever want to do it again, God. And I don't want to be drawn. I don't want to listen to the, to, the, to the things that would draw me away to do or to say or to act how I have. God, forgive me. And thank you for your precious blood, Jesus, that continues to flow to wash me clean. I thank you, Lord. It says in verse 39, we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. See how the writer now brings himself right? See, that's why I say that he is writing to believers. This whole book, this whole letter, is the focus is on believing Jews who have become Christians. We are not, we, you and me, we are not of those who draw back unto perdition. Some had. Some had been in their midst and drawn back, but not the ones that, who were getting this letter. But of them that believe, we're going on to the saving of the soul, as Peter wrote in his first letter. Oh, there's great joy in knowing the Lord, I'm telling you. You know, though we get tempted, though we have intimidations, though we're challenged many times in our walk, knowing the Lord knowing His faithfulness, knowing His comfort, knowing His strength, knowing the hope that we have in Him, trusting Him, resting in Him, and waiting patiently for Him. These believers are being exhorted to go on now to perfection. Don't look back, even as we're being exhorted to go on to perfection the same way. Encouragement. The true and the faithful, he says, will go on even when persecution threatens. Why? Because their hope is in the Lord and the just shall live by faith. Let's pray. Father, maybe as we think about the things that the writer is challenging and exhorting and encouraging these believers to press on, maybe, Lord, today, Father, the pressures of this life are tough. The trials. And the way, Lord, even we see compromises within the Christian church today. Lord, it doesn't take much to see the progression. If we read the seven churches that you wrote to in Revelation. That first century church left their first love and it all started from there. Until it ends up in the church of Laodicea where, Lord, you're seen standing at the door and knocking, wanting to come in. It's not even, you're not even welcome there anymore. Lord, I believe we're approaching a day, that day, Lord, We're seeing the compromises within the Christian church today. We're seeing churches, Lord, that have been known over the years and over the centuries of being strong, solid Christian churches, and we're seeing them compromise today. The truth of your word. And of course, Lord, for anyone that stands upon your word, we feel the pressure because we're not going with the flow. 
God, may we stand strong in the power of your might. May we put our hands to the plow, Lord, and keep going, pressing on. May our walk be pleasing to you, Lord. May we walk in the grace that you have provided, Lord. Father, give us strength when the temptations come, when the persecution comes, when the intimidation comes. Let us hold on, Lord. Knowing God, as Peter wrote, the end of our faith, the salvation of our souls. Lord God, we love you. And may our witness, may our testimony, God, be that which pleases you as you mold us and shape us. Conform us into the image of your Son. May we be willing vessels, God, that in these last days, Lord, we would be a light that shines ever so brightly. That people look at us and have no doubt, Lord, in their mind of who we are, who we serve. Though we're in the world, we're not of it. Strengthen us, Lord as the just shall live by faith. Not justified in our own efforts, in our own energy, but because of our faith in you. Father, as we close this morning, I ask, Lord, if there are any this morning who have gathered with us, who have never come, into a personal and living relationship with you through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. It's not about church. It's about you. It's only about you. It's always about you. And Father, if any have joined us today, you're asking them to take that step of faith to receive you into their life, to confess their sins before you, and to receive the gift, the free gift of salvation for their souls. So Father, today as we we close, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just move upon us. I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would just fall upon us. And Father, if anyone has joined us today who has never taken that step of faith, I pray while every eye is closed and every head is bowed and believers are praying in this room, if there are any who God is moving upon your heart right now, that he's asking you to just take that step, that you would be obedient and respond to his call and his love and his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness for your life. For whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so I ask today, is there any, any today, who would say yes to Jesus. That knows that beyond a shadow of a doubt, He is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but through Him. That there is no other way to heaven but through Him. If you'll confess your sin, because sin is what separates one from, from God, and the Bible says it all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, so it's not pointing the finger at any particular one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Is death, separation from God for all eternity, but the free gift of God is eternal life to those who will call upon His name and be saved. Is that you this morning? Is there anyone who's joined us today who would say yes to Jesus? If I can pray for you, I want you right where you're seated this morning just to lift your head and to look at me and say, yes, Richie, I confess my sin. I want to become a Christian. And I know it's through faith in Jesus Christ who died for my sins. If that's you, will you just lift your head where you're seated this morning I might pray for you. Right now, is there anyone here, anyone that's joined us this morning? Just right where you're seated. And we'll pray for you as you're welcomed into the family of God. Anyone at all? Amen.
Well, God is good. He is good and His grace flows today. Father, I, I praise You and I thank You, Lord. That God, we can walk in Your grace, the grace of Your love and Your tender care upon our lives. And I pray, God, that you give us the strength in the days ahead, Lord. Because we know, God, that the days ahead are going to be tough. They're going to be difficult. They're going to be hard. There are going to be many things that come at us, Lord, to test our faith. And that you give us the strength, Lord, just to stand up and be tall. To be strong. To not waver. Because we're walking, Lord. We're walking in you. We're walking with you. And we're walking by faith. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand up. Lord, I want to live my life to please you. I bring my heart before you to remold. Make of me a vessel fit for honor That I might shine for you as sparkling gold To be pleasing you Pleasing you This is all I I bring my heart before you to remold. Make of me a vessel fit for honor that I might shine for you as sparkling gold to be pleased. God bless you guys. Thanks for coming today, and uh, just have a good week. Stick around, fellowship with fellowship with one another, and hopefully we'll see you here next Sunday, and in Broomfield in two weeks. God bless you.